I'm Roman Yossi of the National Predator. I'm Dante Fabro of the Nashville Predators. This is Philip Forsberg of the Nashville Predators. I'm Colton Sissons of the Nashville Predators. I'm Eustace Aros of the Nashville Predators. You're listening to the Renegades of Puck with Crazy Charlie. Welcome to the Bunk. Welcome to the Renegades of Puck podcast. I'm your host and captain, Crazy Charlie Sonny. And before we get started on the half step in hockey coverage, first, let me direct you to our home website, renegadesofpuck.com. Once you go to renegadespuck.com, you'll learn everything you need to know about the show and what you're getting educated about the show. Then you can click on that merchandise tab. It's going to take you straight to our classic logo, to your pride logo t-shirt, all of the different special event t-shirts, and so much more. All the gimmicks you've come to know and love and expect from the Renegades of Puck, all still available on our online store. Socks, throw pillows, wall art, bed sets, and so much more. You can fit your entire home or your entire person. We sure would appreciate if you would go ahead and do that. After all, We've sold out so that you can buy in. Social media is of critical importance to this independent hockey operation, so listen up, Renegades. Here's how you can help support the cause. You can find us on X. You can find us on Threads. You can find us on Facebook, also on Instagram and TikTok. So please follow along on any or all of those platforms, whatever it is you prefer. Just follow along and interact and let the people know where they can find us. YouTube, thank you so much for the new subscribers. We sure to appreciate each and every one of you. Picked up a couple this week, and that sure is great news. We'd like to continue picking up some more and gaining more momentum on that particular front renegades of buck tv a lot of effort a lot of work goes into it and we provide it to you completely for free so please pass those links around and let other people know that how they can find the show today the audio version of the show doing doing incredible closing out the month of october in a very strong way having a very very good lead into the halloween day and we are so so appreciative of that thank you to the full press network and full press predators podcast we've reached over six million listeners this year alone so we are sure appreciative of that you can find us on spotify you can find us on google stitcher and several other podcast platforms just search renegades of puck in your preferred platform today venmo is how you can financially support the renegades of puck please make a donation Donation of any any dollar amount. Use that the QR code that's currently on your screen or search Renegades of Puck in Venmo. Every dollar goes along with helping this hockey operation here known as the Renegades of Puck. So we are super appreciative. Stick taps, love, and respect to everyone who has helped us along in increasing some of the technologies behind the scenes. You've heard me mention a couple of times before, and it's stuff I never thought I would be involved with, but it is stuff that now I am involved with. Networks and uh, data storage and all of these uh, other things. So please, uh, if you can spare a couple of dollars, we sure could use them. We've got a lot of late night games coming up. Yeah, this week while the Nashville Predators are on their West Coast road trip. So speaking of that West Coast road trip, it's time to get to the business. It's time to get to the Noah Hastap Hockey coverage. So let me deliver this. It's time for operation number eight. 12. That's right, show number 812. And at this moment in hockey history, we pause for just a moment, do some long-form talk about everything that's happened with the Nashville Predators up until this point in the season. Had a chance to join Jersey Jim Berenger on his podcast, and we talked all things Nashville Predators, Western Conference, and some other issues from around the league. It's a fantastic conversation, and I'm bringing that to you right now. Final word on hockey. I'm your host, Jim Berenger, the voice of Full Press Hockey. You can get it anywhere, iTunes, Spotify, wherever you get your podcast. I'm joined by a great guest, a good friend of mine, Charlie Sanye, Renegades of the Puck podcast, Full Press Preds. Charlie, it's great to talk to you. I have you on my podcast now. Uh, Jersey Jim, man, it's a pleasure to be here. I'm so happy and so excited, and I can't wait to talk box with you. Let's get on. Let's get on to it. Season's underway. You're down there, Nashville Predators, one of my teams that I love to follow, one of the teams I'm excited to see this year. Scoring is up around the league. Predators are one of those teams that can score. They just can't do it against Edmonton for some reason, but we'll get to that later on. Um, but Predators average about three and a half goals a game. Some things that you've seen to begin the year that you've liked and some things maybe you haven't liked and maybe they can improve on. I'll tell you, a couple of things I really like is the pace of play. Now, the team hasn't caught up to the pace yet. It's still something they have to think about rather than it being instinctual, as I imagine it'll become over the course of 20, 40, 60 games. It is, after all, uh, first season GM, first season head coach, a whole lot of different players on the roster. But what I love so far is the pace pushing it right up the ice every time someone gets the puck they are looking to spring someone for a rush for a scoring opportunity and it's just a lot more offensively driven and offensively minded than it was under the previous 
to, well, let's face it, under all of the previous head coaches, starting with Barry Trotz all the way through Peter Laviolette, John Hines, I feel like this is the most offensive-driven team that the National Prayers have put out there on the ice. And once they start to connect on a more consistent basis, I truly think it's going to be a rather enjoyable offense to watch, uh, even for the casual viewer who's just checking in on the game. Yeah, I agree with you. I mean, Andrew Burnett, what he's done behind the bench. I mean, look, to me, he was a big loss for the Devils on their coaching staff. I think he did a lot more than people thought he did, um, not only with the offense, but the defense as well. And I, and I like what, you know, this Preds team is doing, you know, the, the scoring, the young players, Tommy Novak is one of the guys I, uh, I just love to watch. He's just been a great player. But you said it. This looks like a different Preds team than it has in years past. And we kind of saw signs of that at the end of last year Mm -hmm. when the young kids were coming into the lineup. Absolutely right about that. The last, say, quarter of the season, I think that may have shaved off some time in what we would traditionally call a rebuild era and maybe made it more of a retool era because it showed that the youth in the system was ready to come up and participate in a positive way and perhaps not need a season or two before things started going in that direction and you mentioned Tommy Novak and that's that's really where I start with it right now Tommy Novak leading the team and scoring with five points and I like to say this now every time I talk about Tommy Novak all he does is make plays he finds the quiet spot in the ice in the slot and he gets that shot right on net he makes the pass at the right time he seems to just be in the right place at the right time and has incredibly high hockey iq and i i just keep summing it up as all he does is make plays i'm highly impressed with the start of the season for uh, tommy novak the other night the the pass that he made to set up sherwood's one timer was just every bit of it was the excellence of execution that we haven't seen on a skill level here in nashville in quite some time from any one besides, say, a Philip Forsberg or a Roman Yossi's host. Pretty incredible to see what Tommy Novak is already doing in this early part of the season. Yeah, definitely. I mean, you mentioned Forsberg. I mean, look, the guy, all he does is get points and score. And he's he's the star, the straw that stirs the drink. And it was an unbelievable trade way back when, mm-hmm. when, when um, David Poyle traded Martin Erap for Philip Forsberg. Probably a steal, steal of a trade steal I, and i emphasize steal like you mentioned excellence of execution i love the wrestling reference everybody knows i'm a big wrestling guy i know you are too so i love mm-hmm. the bret hart reference he's one of my faves but forsberg and you know forsberg to me continues to just show that he is this team any all the offense goes through him but again tommy novak is there now the future is being set but they're playing with a fast pace Right. Usually, Preds would just take advantage of defensive zone turnovers. Tra- no, they can transition. They can take it offensively. And the additions of look to me, everybody to me, I always liked Ryan O'Reilly. I thought the signing was awesome. A lot of people weren't eh, on it. What he's brought to this team, this, this team, it's like he was born to be a Nashville Predator. And he fits in great with Forsberg and Parson right there on the top line. And everybody knows, anybody who's ever watched a team that Ryan O'Reilly is on, how much he does and how many little important things he does. From the face-offs to making sure that everything is covered out there, all the positions. Uh, On a six-on-five delayed call earlier in the season, there's Ryan O'Reilly selling out on his belly, making a play with the tip of the stick to keep the puck in. What do the Preds do five seconds later? They put the puck in the back of the net. Those are the... The types of plays that don't make the box score, they're the types of plays you and I talk about, Jim, but they don't always make the hype. They don't always get out there. And and it's just one of those things that Ryan O'Reilly does amongst a plethora of things that he's doing out there on the team. And most importantly, beyond the skill, beyond the on the ice, he is the example. He is showing these young guys when to eat your breakfast, when to do your workout, when to get to bed at night, how not to be out chipping and putting at three o'clock in the morning in one of your teammates' backyards. He's teaching these youngsters and showing them by example how to be such nhl professionals and he's also performing at a pretty high level on the ice he does have four points on the season two goals two assists already and again it's been impressive to see what he's done i didn't know what he was going to do beyond being a mentor but so far on the ice he has uh, exceeded my expectations in this early part of the season another guy i really like on this team that they signed well two other guys really i've always been a fan of gus nyquist uh just what he brings to the team but I've also been a big fan of Luke Shen since he came into the league when he was drafted with Toronto, what he's done around the league with Tampa, went back to Toronto last year, the signing this year. Again, I talked about it on Renegades of the Puck podcast. I'll mention it here. 
character guys, right? This is what mm-hmm. Barry Trotz wanted. He didn't like nothing against Matt Duchesne and Ryan Johansson. They're great hockey players, but again, room guys, character guys, maybe not the best guys in the room. Now you have those guys in the room and you can see it's coming together. Again, you kind of wish they didn't kind of come out flat against Vancouver because that's a game you really need. But I've been really impressed with this team this year. The Nashville Predators have shown, for the most part, at five-on-five hockey that they can compete with the other teams in uh, and across the league. They started the season with five consecutive playoff opponents from last season, and they held their own. It's not easy to go into Tampa, Toronto, and Madison, uh, Tampa Bay, Boston, and Madison Square Garden all at the start of the season, while also, you know, welcoming in Edmonton and the uh, Seattle Kraken here in Nashville. So the first five games of the season were tough, but there were spurts in every one of those games that showed the Predators can compete compete once they get a little more adjusted to their system maybe once they get some more chemistry and certainly once they get Andrew Brunette's style to be more of an instinct thing rather than a thinking about things so the Preds have shown at five on five they can compete with UC Soros in net they are always always up for a victory and uh, if it wasn't for the special teams which I know is going to take some time to get adjusted but if it wasn't for the bad special teams in a couple of those games the Preds would have been perhaps a little better record already in the season but you you mentioned the Vancouver game and that was tough because once the Preds, and it took them almost 50 minutes to get their skates underneath them in that game. Once they got their skates underneath them, they showed that they can skate with the Vancouver Canucks. And I, I like to call that game the other night, Jim, a learning curve game because Vancouver was executing at a high level the style that Andrew Burnett wants his Nashville Predators to execute at. And it made the Preds look a little discombobulated. It made them look a little bit slow even in the first and second period. So I think the Vancouver Canucks gave a good learning lesson and the other night to the Nashville Predators. And the Preds cannot spend 50 out of 60 regulation minutes just trying to find their game and get their skates on them. Once they did, though, they were right there and they were only one goal down with a with the, the six on five at the end. They had the opportunities. They just couldn't seize on them. But they can skate and they can compete. It's just going to be a matter of adjusting and learning and getting to that point that everything is pointed and funneled in the same direction. Oh, I hear you 100%. It reminds me of New Jersey. I mean, the Devils, their record 3 2 and 1. Yeah, it's all, all well and good. They're sitting in third right now, currently. But again, that can change day to day. They played, in my opinion, played five good periods of hockey and seven bad periods of hockey. And hence why their record is what their record is. Mm-hmm. I mean, you play 20 good minutes against Washington. That's all well and good. You still got to play 40 other minutes. And consistently, New Jersey's just not putting 60 minutes together. And you can see it down in Nashville too, the similarities. Right. I've watched a bunch of like to me, one of their most complete games was against the Rangers in Madison Square mm-hmm. Garden. I thought they played really well. Yes. And it was funny. So we I was watching the Tampa game, right? And I had just been on your podcast and we were talking about middle of the ice and like all the stuff what McDonough does and everything. And it was kind of funny to see how Nashville really took advantage of it. I feel like they were listening and, and watching and 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 say, hey, these guys know what they're talking about. But you could see what I was talking about when I was on Renegades of the Puck and how it translated to the first game against Tampa. I was really impressed how they competed, but they just had to stay out of the penalty box because Tampa's power play is just lethal. Just lethal. When when you are dealing with professional championship level teams, and there's no team a uh, better example than the Tampa Bay Lightning in the last generation, uh, you cannot give them those types of opportunities. You, you give a team like that five power plays, you're going to lose. There's just no question, no doubt about it. They did the same thing when they went to Boston. They were competing against the Bruins, gave them too many power play opportunities. The Bruins are always going to capitalize when it comes to that. So I look forward to the special teams getting a little bit better. We all know, maybe perhaps leaning a little too hard on the power play numbers early in season. We all know what Andrew Brunette was able to do in Florida and in New Jersey and how those special teams units turned around. Now it's just a matter of everybody letting the sauce cook a little bit and backing off the stove and not stirring it quite so many times. Because I think we're getting a little little too amped up about them currently being the 14th rated power play in the NHL. Whole new system, whole new units. And I I love what the, the second unit, the young players are getting power play opportunity. They're getting equivalent minutes to your Philip Forsberg and your Ryan O'Reilly. And that's great. Andrew Burnett developing a veteran power play unit and a youth power play unit. And that is going to pay off as the season moves along. Well, I love it because that's something that I've been harking on coaches for a long time for the, the, the time I've been covering this league. Even when I was a player, Mm -hmm. you know, playing a lot, like in the game, you have special skilled players, 
they it does them no good if they're sitting on a bench not on a power play not on a, not on a penalty kill not playing top line minutes i know you have to earn that but you kind of have to put them there in order for them to succeed and i love that andrew burnett's developing that second power play unit just of young guys because that's what they really really need you it's all well and good that forsberg can be out there mm-hmm. but you don't want him out there 2 minutes right Right, and the youth getting out there the other night. Uh, just look at the most recent game's box score. I see Luke Evangelista, 354 power play in time on ice. I see Fagimo, 314 in time on ice. Uh, Novak, 314 time on ice. That's great to see that that particular group is getting time and they're putting up points they're converting Tommy Novak's been good on the power play Fagimo got his first goal as Nashville Predator the other night Uh, so it's good the youth is mixing in well with the veterans and for Philip Forsberg listen he is what stirs the drink when it comes to the offense but he's only eclipsed the 40 goal mark once in his career and he has been notorious for slow starts in October November before just getting on an absolute roll after Thanksgiving and then the numbers seem to always work out exactly as we anticipate around 30 goals maybe more if he could just find that consistency here in October and again only one goal and I know everybody made a big deal about it because it was a slap shot he carried the puck in the zone on the power play and those are things Philip Forsberg doesn't typically do but I'm telling you and you know this already Jim he can score in any style from anywhere at any time it's just not as consistent as the other premier goal scorers in the league and that's the only thing stopping him from being mentioned in the same breath as those other 40 and 50 goal scorers that are around those marks every single season. All right, consistency is the name of the game when it comes to any player. You see mm-hmm. it. I, I, you know, I hark on this about Jesper Bratt in New Jersey, right? If he can consistently just be noticeable every night, get on the score sheet, do what he has to do. He's one of those players that, okay, you're getting paid around $8 million to mm-hmm. do something. That's great. If you're not, all right, that's a problem. You know, Timo Meyer, we saw he got benched. Now he's turned it around. You know, obviously, Jack Hughes is just unbelievable what he does with the paw. Just like, I mean, could the Islanders give him more time? I mean, really, <laughs> in that, on that overtime goal, could they give him more time? <laughs> Unbelievable. Uh, just, I love the youth movement in this league. Hughes is clearly one of the, the strongest of this new current generation, but, but I get to cover the Central Division and on a constant basis, I get to see uh, Jason Robertson uh, oh. with Dallas, and, and I get to see Kaprizov with Minnesota, and now I, I get to see Bedard with uh, Chicago, of course, and Winnipeg adds its own, and St. Louis brings its own, and uh, it's so many incredible young players. I, I actually think that they don't get enough content conversation uh, around the league Uh, some of these players I just rolled off I mean every time I watch them play at Bridgestone Arena here in Nashville they're just otherworldly at skill and skating and everything that guys we used to poke holes in the game well you know he's got a good shot but he's not fast on his skates no these players are coming into the league as the total package and they're doing it younger than they've ever done it before and they look faster and more skilled than any previous generation and I love where the game is right now and and I can't wait to see it continue growing Bedard is the next one and we'll see who comes after that but it's the youth movement and infusion especially out here in the central and I I mentioned the central because I get to see so much of it Uh, it's just incredible watching these young players but man you get to watch a special one up there in New Jersey on a on a nightly basis and and the highlights packages already I mean Look, he's already gotten individual hardware, as we like to say. Uh, I think that's just going to continue adding to the trophy case over the years, both individually and probably in a, in a team way. The way he leads, the way he carries an offense, and just the confidence he instills in the players around him. It's so awesome to see a young player uh, competing at such a high caliber. Absolutely. it's it, the, the youth movement in the NHL right now is, is awesome. Like, you just so many young players, you said it. The central – alone i mean you, i mean not even the young guys i mean mckinnon's still young but mckinnon's there rant is there you know mccarr taves like those guys and uh, you mentioned evangeliska tommy novak i mean is is novak it's still considered a rookie or is, it, is he in his second third official second third season in the league uh, Novak, I think, is in his second full season now. Okay. He, had, he had the initial call up and then suspiciously disappeared off everybody's radar for about 13 months, uh, then came back up last year, the last late half of the season with all the other youth and clearly has cemented himself, uh, at least for now, a permanent spot on this roster because you can pen that guy in every night. He's going to go out there and make plays for you. 
I mean, I could compare him to Dallas, what they had with Wyatt Johnson. He just comes in and just doesn't miss a beat. I mean, like like I said, I, I love what Nashville brings to the table. Like I said, your back end, you got McDonough, Luke Shen. You know, I love what Tyson Barry is for this team. It was a great hockey trade for at home mm-hmm. for Barry. They're doing things right there. Barry Trotz, you know, like I said, when I spoke with him at, at the draft, he was very excited about this team. Very excited. And he said, you, you got to watch out for us. We're, you know, look, look for this team. And I was like, all right, Barry, I'll be watching you guys because I'm excited when you start to see the changeover with the mix of veterans and you know what's coming. And that excites me. Oh, it's tremendously exciting. And, and just one quick commentary on the decor. Ryan McDonough is doing the same thing with the young defenseman that Ryan O'Reilly is doing with the young forward grouping. Alex Carrier was already a pretty good prospect to become a full-time NHL defender. Second deep pair minutes this season, up near the top of the league in block shots, playing on the PK with McDonough. He's been skating with McDonough during regular five on play, five play as well. I don't think anyone has absorbed what their partner does more quickly than Alex. Carrier. He is just out there laying that body on the line. He is, seems to always be in the right position. And for a player who was on the fringe before the Luke Shen injury, uh, he has really taken this opportunity to put himself in a, in a very good spot as the second pair D-man and very reliable. And I think that he's going to end up having quite the career. And right, sometimes the right mentor comes along for, you know, when Phil Housley came here as a coach that really helped Ryan Ellis and Seth Jones become next tier players. And now I truly think coach on the ice, McDonough and O'Reilly are going to help this generation of Nashville Predators grow into true professionals. And Alex Carrier could go on to become a star. Moving out Matias Ekholm was always going to be tough on the decor. He ate up a lot of minutes. He played very physical and he was on the PK blocking shots all the time. Alex Carrier has filled in that spot very nicely. If he keeps up this level of consistency, he'll be near the tops of the league and block shots at the end of the season. He'll no doubt lead the Predators in block shots and he'll be one of the most important players on the blue line for the penalty kill so the the decor is doing good at this point in time the shen injury unfortunately limited players uh, limited everybody from seeing only one game and that one game in tampa was rough for everyone on the decor because it was in tampa and you had so many power plays and special teams events so when shen gets back it's going to create a little bit of a conundrum alex carrier dante fabro luzon who's going to end up losing those minutes because we know when Shen's back and healthy, he's going to be reinserted into a lot. They haven't even had a chance to see him play yet. He has to at least get some opportunities here. But I think the decor is progressing along nicely. I think McDonough and Carrier are surprisingly a very strong 20 to 22 minutes a night defense pairing. Yeah, I agree with you. I, I mean, McDonough finally healthy last year. He didn't really have – he had some health issues last year with um, – Nashville when he came over got to adjust he's coming from Tampa it always takes time to adjust mm-hmm. to new things even now you have a new system with um, Andrew Burnett but he's such a true professional one of those guys wherever he goes he's a winner he did it when he was with the Rangers again you still just imagine if Montreal kept all those defensemen and they didn't trade McDonough for Gomez and the list goes on but that's revisionist <laughs> history you mentioned UC Soros Mm-hmm. I mean, this guy back there just backstops everything. There, to me, now again, I've only seen highlights. I've seen some full games of the the Preds, but sometimes he looks interested. Sometimes he doesn't look interested. You know, I know his name continues to be out there in, in the circles of is he going to get traded? Is he not going to get traded? But if this team's going to stay competitive, you got to keep UC Soros on this team. UC Soros on the team means the team is making a run at something. Whether they make the playoffs or not, now who knows? We have so far to go on that. But with UC Soros, they have a chance. Now, you may have to overwork him over the course of an 82-game season to get one of those fringe playoff spots. And then if he's overworked and exhausted, it's not going to go very far, as we've seen with this Predators team in the past when they've overworked their starting goaltender just to get to the tournament. So for UC Soros, now that the trade rumors are, it seems to be in the past, uh, they probably will resurface if the Predators start to have a bad record. But for right now, not here 
hearing a lot of chatter about that. What I am seeing is that Andrew Burnett has decided seven games so far, seven starts for UC Saros, and if it hadn't been for the Edmonton Oilers making it look just so, so easy at Bradstone Arena in the first 20 minutes of that game, UC Saros would have played every minute of this season so far. I know there are 14 back-to-backs for the Predators teams coming up, a lot of them in December. So I know that Lankin is going to get his starts, but right now, Saros, seven games started on the season, holds a record of three and four, nine, 10 save percentage, two, five, eight goals against. And one of those is a shutout, one of those victories. So he's off to a good start. His edge work, his tracking, those are his best skills that he has. He's undersized, as everybody who's ever watched the Predators at UC Saros knows, but he makes that edge work and his skate work and his track of the puck it seems to be able to overcome any of the size problems that people seem to think he might have uh that top corner is not there people think it's there they go for it and it's not there uc saros is really a spectacular goaltender uh, to watch night and night out and jim i think some of the times you see him when he might look like he's uh, not uh, that interested because he's not facing 40 45 shots on goal like he was last season and in previous season the preds so far have done a pretty good job only giving up 28 shots against per game and in the games they've won and i think you would have probably notated this from the rangers game at madison square garden he hasn't had to work very hard at all the team in front of him has done a remarkable job i like to call it the tenacious effort and may ham approach everybody with a stick in a lane blocking a body and taking care of business before it comes down to the last line of defense the juice in net right there so in the wins Saros hasn't had to face that many shots and in the losses while he's faced a heavier workload it's been mostly on special teams so I think that it's just he's actually not working nearly as hard or being worked nearly as hard so far this season not nearly as many breakaways yes the penalty shots and <laughs> that's something we could talk about just across the league the guy faces five penalty shots in his entire career before this season and then two in the first four games of the season that that's a pretty good indicator that that call is up across the board but UC Saros gives the Predators a chance to win night in and night out when he was with the Milwaukee Admirals coming up through the system he gave them a chance to win night in night out took them all the way to a championship and that's what he hopes to one day do for the Nashville Predators if not a multiple time Vezina finalist and a team that's in need of strong goaltending Edmonton going down towards the playoff run uh, you never know what you could get for a UC Saros so he is the most valuable commodity on the team and also the most important player on the ice right now i would 100 percent agree with that and if he gets this predators team near the playoffs in the playoffs and has great numbers to me he's a pheasant trophy finalist he could be a hard mm-hmm. trophy guy you know i know everybody looks down upon the goalies for a hard trophy because they have their own award but it doesn't matter it's most valuable player to his team and that's how i view the definition of it that's the way it's supposed to be viewed as. And UC Saros is the most valuable player to his team. Because as we saw, when they went to the playoffs against Colorado the one year, yeah, some of the calls didn't go their way, this and that. But they were physically dominated and they were outscored because they didn't have UC Saros. Nobody knows what but that series would have been like if Saros was in the net. But we know what it was when Connor Ingram was there. And Connor Ingram played well, and he's playing well down in Arizona right now. Mm-hmm. But – it's a different team when you when you have an elite goaltender between the pipes. It's a different game. You see it around the league. You see it with Tampa right now when Vasilevsky's not there. You know, Winnipeg's got their own struggles. But, again, you mentioned it before. Is it a mental thing with Edmonton for Nashville? Like, like they, Edmonton like, just seems to own them. It's it's karma, Jim, for the entire, I like to call it the Pekka Rene administration. During the Rene administration here in Nashville, uh, you could have put owned by Pekka Rene over, yeah. over, over Edmonton's locker room. I mean, it was something like eight consecutive victories for Pekka Rene against the Oilers and uh, the an eight or nine on the road. So during the Pekka Rene administration, it was so enjoyable to see that the Predators were going to be facing off against the Edmonton Oilers because business was going to be up, clicks were going to be up and I was going to be able to write something like Pekka Rene made 32 saves tonight in a four to one victory versus the Oilers since Pekka Rene's retirement though that coin has flipped and the Nashville fan base and the Nashville franchise is getting the karma and the return and the receipt for sure I don't 
quite understand it. Uh, they just seem paralyzed by Dreisaitl and McDavid. Whenever the two of them are on the ice, no matter what the Predators want to do, they just cannot do it. They allowed for the first ever, Jim, accidental spin a goal here at Bridgestone. Oh. I mean, what, what in the world? Watching it live, I said to myself, wait a minute, didn't he get hit two or three times plus stick check plus kind of bobble the puck there at the end? I get home, I start looking at the replays, and I look at it over and over again. I'm like, he did, this was an accident. He didn't even mean to do any of the things that happened right here. And that's just how it's gone uh, for the Oilers uh, against the Predators. I, I don't know how much longer it can continue. I hope that the Predators find something to respond to instead of looking like deer in the headlights. I, everybody always says in those situations, well, maybe you got to be more physical. Maybe you got to do more of this. I, I honestly don't have an answer. And I don't think the Preds do right now either. And McDavid and Dreisaitl and Nugent Hopkins aren't going anywhere anytime nope. soon. So. They better figure it out, Jim, before they end up on the wrong side of a seven-game series, which is what the National Prayers will probably have to deal with if they're a team on the rise and Edmonton is consistently near the top in the Pacific. Uh, it sounds like those teams are going to cross paths at some point in the next couple of seasons in a best-of-seven scenario, and it's not going to go well for Nashville unless they start figuring out how to slow that team down and take advantage of the weaknesses of the Edmonton Oilers, which is their goaltending. Only scoring one goal against the Oilers I was astounded not that the Oilers scored six not what McDavid and Dreisaitl did to the Predators I was astounded that the Predators only managed to score one goal against that Edmonton Oilers goaltending tandem oh, I was very shocked to see only one goal and they gave up six I was like <laughs> wait a minute the Preds are averaging three goals right now I'm like how right. are they not scoring and I didn't know Edmonton put a and that was after they got spanked around by Vancouver twice mm -hmm. and and they wanted to make a good defensive effort. And like you said, look, good players know the puck always goes to them. Somebody asked me about that play with McDavid. I'm like, it's McDavid. Enough said. Like, I, yeah. I don't, I'm not going to explain it because you can't explain it. It's McDavid. That's Jim, just stuff happens. When it happened, there were people that I know who know the game incredibly well, just looking around at each other like they were trying to be the Travolta meme. Like they were just like, what? Huh? What, what do I say about this? How do I tweet this out? What the, the accidental spinorama until I understood that verbiage is the only way I can communicate it. And the way you just summed it up is perfectly. It's McDavid. And if it happens to be against the Preds, <laughs> anything, anything is possible. Anything is possible, but you, yeah, like you said, real quick, Edmonton's defense, not very good. Look, I, I hate, I, I don't like to single out players, right? I, I hate doing it, but Darnell Nurse is just such a weakness on that Edmonton Oilers defense. He's just out of position so much and causes so many unnecessary mistakes and not turnovers, but he puts himself out of position that leads to two on ones and backdoor plays, and a goal you just can't make every save. And you saw it last year against Vegas. You saw it against L.A. And the only reason Edmonton, by the way, got past L.A. is because can't, um, Corpus Allo can't make a save, and Jack Campbell started uh, came in and saved their season. Other than that, Edmonton had no business winning that series, and Vegas just pummeled them anyway uh, because you can't just rely on your power play to win hockey games. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you got to play defense. Look. I say it before. Bruce Cassidy's a great coach. Why? Vegas averages three and a half to four goals a game, but they don't give up that many. They still play defense. They average about two goals a game. They give up about a round. That's what they did in the playoffs. Edmonton, and don't do it. And it's working. Edmonton, they don't do that. And that's why I never understood why they were ahead of Vegas in a betting odds to win a Stanley Cup. Everybody's paying, oh, Oilers, Oilers. I'm like, okay. Sure. You guys want to pick the Oilers? Fine. I'm going to take the champs, and I'll I'll be real smart. And Vegas already just off to another great start to the season. But before I get to that, let's the Edmonton defense, the, the getting out of position thing, the giving up the odd man rushes, that's what leads to the incredibly untimely penalties as well. Mm -hmm. uh, and the untimely penalties are what make Nurse a lightning rod from the other teams because when he takes a penalty, he really takes a penalty and he drives uh, other players crazy. He gets in the middle of it and sometimes it's to the detriment. It's 
slows the game down. It's not what that particular Oilers team needs. I, I do think everything besides the forward grouping of the Edmonton Oilers needs a little bit of a look at the decor and the goaltending. And I think that they're probably going to realize that because how can you not look on the horizon and see that you're going to have to go through Vegas or Colorado this year. Those are going to be the two teams that are probably going to finish at the tops of the divisions uh, and they are going to be incredibly <laughs> tough outs. I mean, Colorado and Vegas got better somehow in, in the off season. They didn't sit around and say, well, we've won recently. It's okay. Let's just no. they, they have hunger. When I watch this Colorado avalanche team and this Vegas golden Knights team at the beginning of the season, I see a, an animal that is not like other teams around the Western conference right now. They just have, this killer instinct to them right now. And of course I've been tracking the abs a lot because I know they're going to be the class of the central division, but I've also wanted to follow up and see how Ryan Johansson did moving out there to the Rocky mountains. And aside from the first game of the season, Ryan Johansson is uh, performing quite well as you knew a big body veteran center would do with so many high skilled playmakers all around him. So I see the Colorado avalanche as, as running away with the central division this year. And I see Vegas truly being the, the Kings of the, the Kings, the Kings, yeah. Pacific yet again uh, this year. And, and for Edmonton, if you don't tighten it up real fast, you are not going to be very successful when it comes to the second round or the conference finals, whichever it is, when you run into one of those two teams. I agree with you 100%. I mean, Vegas to me is the class of the Western Conference. Colorado's right there, too. Look again, you know, Johansson's playing well, but again, second line center issues. Let's see how long they can, how long it can last. Can mm -hmm. Gorgiev turn it around for them goaltending wise? Um, they really haven't played their backup either uh, in games. It's really been Gorgiev all the way. Uh, McCarr's there. Taves is there. But again, Vegas just – when they don't have their A game, it doesn't matter. B and C games still beat you. Mm -hmm. And they did it against Flyers. They've done it against a bunch of teams. They have a chip on their shoulder. I, I lighten this, and I use the example. For people who haven't seen it, the last dance with Michael Jordan and the Bulls, right? This guy took everything personally, even if it was some little comment. Okay, fine. Take it personal. Okay, Vegas, they may not, speaking with guys out there, they said, ah, we don't listen to this stuff. We don't read any of that. Yeah, BS. Okay. <laughs> they took being sixth in, in the odds to win the Stanley Cup. Nobody picking them to win the Stanley Cup personal. Like they took it personal last year in the playoffs. When they said nobody was picking them to win the Stanley Cup, fine. Mm -hmm. Okay, fine. You guys pick who you want. We're going to go show you we're the best team. And they're doing it again this year. Look, then Vegas and Boston, the only undefeated teams in the league right now. And there's a reason why. And Vegas just continues to do what they do. They lose Riley Smith, so what? Okay, big deal. Next man up. And that's what their been motto is. And I said it before. Bruce Cassidy is their coach. Great defensive system, but they can still pump three goals in on you. Getting timely saves. And they're still not 100% healthy. They're still missing D guys on their back end. Imagine when that team gets healthier. And they're just like, yeah, we're on a mission. All we do is create history. We've done it since day one. We're going to go show you that we're going to win another Stanley Cup this year. Jim, there were people mocking the Las Vegas Golden Knights on expansion draft day going, who are these pieces what? right what wait who did they get why would they pick up this no name guy instead of this big name guy and listen if anybody hasn't come around and realized yet that vegas has had a plan from the first minute until this exact minute they have been executing at an incredibly high level you use next man up and that's exactly what they've been since day one. Oh, we're a bunch of cast offs and rejects and nobody wanted us well we're going to show you we're going to roll four lines out there and if for some reason somebody can't go somebody else will jump right in that spot and they just keep doing it and doing it and doing it and they've had the ultimate success now and they're not slowing down anytime soon so around the league in a league that loves parody and loves to steal other ideas i'm really surprised that i haven't seen more teams attempting it's not always going to be successful but attempting to do what vegas is doing and putting together parts that maybe don't make sense to the media or the fan base but they have that hunger that drive that desire and it's going to turn into a Golden Knight situation where it just catches fire and it has not stopped out there uh, in the desert. It, it's impressive to watch. I thought it would fall apart after a year or two, but no, it has not. It's continued to grow, improve, and there's no reason to believe it's going to slow down uh, anytime soon. They're going to be right there at the end again this year and uh, another force to be reckoned with. Absolutely. Well, it's funny, you know, speaking with guys last year, 
Kelly McCrimmon even came out and said this, and George McPhee had said this as well. They modeled what they did down the middle out of what Dallas did, right? They had the big heavy centers down the middle. You had your big D as well. They learned when they lost to Dallas the one year, I believe it was in the bubble in the conference final. They realized they needed to be a little bit more physical down the middle, a little bit more bigger. Okay, what do they do? They just add some pieces down the middle, move out some guys. Yeah, oh, you've been here since the beginning. Too bad. We're going to ship you out. We want to be like this. And they have been. And look, Dallas to me is another team in the central division. You can't just dismiss because I think they're going to be a good team. Not sure they're going to be up there at the top at the end, but you know, it's going to be Colorado, Dallas, maybe Minnesota, you throw in there as well, because like all those teams just always seem to be battling for it. I see those three teams out there. And then who, who's going to be in that next spot? Who's going to be in the position to try to secure a wild card, uh, Arizona, Winnipeg, Nashville, St. Louis, Chicago. It's truly, it's a hodgepodge. It may just come down to ultimately who does the best against the division in head to head matchups to find themselves in position to possibly secure a wild card, but it's wide open from four on down. And there's, Nobody who truly knows what's going to happen with the Central Division. We've seen a pretty good upheaval in the last couple of years. Now the Avs and the Stars are dominating. Minnesota's right where they've been the last couple of years. And again, Arizona, Winnipeg, Nashville, St. Louis, Chicago. Who's going to battle it out and win the rest of the division to get that fourth spot and potentially a wild card spot if uh, if the Pacific doesn't get uh, both of those wild card teams? The Pacific Division is looking pretty strong early in the season with a lot of good contenders. And I know it's going to be a tough, tough race down the end of the season, but. For for the Nashville Predators, there's no reason to believe that fourth place is unattainable uh, in the Central Division and possibly even pushing, as they like to do sometimes, the Minnesota Wild right there at the third spot. Yeah, I agree with you. I think Nashville can compete for a fourth spot. I mean, it may not happen. Okay, it's just part of the plan. But it, you know what? Barry Trotz is putting in the system that he wants, the players that he wants. You got Brunette there. Yeah, okay, first season, they come up short. So what? So next year's the year we take the next step, right? Mm-hmm. That's what they want to do. Uh, and like you mentioned, Pacific is so crazy, right? You got Vegas, you got Edmonton, you got, well, if Edmonton can figure it out, they'll be there. Mm-hmm. Uh, but you got LA, LA is a team. They, they're trying to model after Vegas, what Vegas does down the middle. You got Kopitar, uh, you have Dubois and Deneau down the middle there and their, their defense is just as good. And they're getting the saves that they need. LA starting to turn around. Vancouver's playing a little bit better. Seattle's maybe starting to figure it out. Calgary, we really don't know what's there. But you mentioned a team before. It's in your division, Arizona. I saw that team firsthand against New Jersey. That team can skate. Man, that team can skate. They got a light, nice, young, t- talented team led by Logan Cooley, Vamelka on the back end. They're de- they, the, the mix, to me, it reminds me of what Nashville's doing. The mix of veterans with the young players, it's really meshing well. Yes, they have some injuries. Jason Zucker's down now. But they've done things the right way. And when Nashville and Arizona get together, it's going to be a fun game. Right now, Arizona's three and two on the season. They're sitting in fourth place. Uh, they got the same amount of points as the Nashville Predators. I think it's going to be a lot of fun. The two teams typically get after each other, and the Preds from the bubble season still have a little bit of history, even with this young Coyotes team. Uh, for when the Coyotes, frankly, ended uh, anything that was the hopes of the Predators making a playoff run anytime in the near future. That that particular time in the bubble in the play-in round as it was called i believe against yeah. the arizona coyotes just that showed the entire national purse fan base that you could run forsberg yossi soros out there all you want but at this point with the coaching staff they had and with the design they had in the lineup it wasn't going to go any farther than that so the arizona coyotes are always interesting to me and they always play the preds uh particularly hard i like having them in the central division i don't mind having them as a division rival and seeing them a couple times a year here at bridgestone arena i'd like to see them continue to to develop and uh if connor ingram gets the start here at bridgestone arena when they come watch out because uh those ex-goalies when they come back and face the preds seem to always have about a 42 45 save shutout uh and and everybody throws their hands up and goes wait a minute you had this guy and you let him go so he could shut you out it seems to always happen against the national purse maybe it's a league-wide trend but i see it under a microscope here uh each and every night oh definitely league-wide trend and you mentioned a league-wide trend before um Penalty shots are up. <laughs> and look, you guys see my comments on X Twitter uh, at um, Jim Berenger, by the way, on Twitter. Uh, if you want to find it, go scroll through the history. It's there. Um, but they call penalty shots that are not penalty shots. And penalty shots that should be penalty shots don't get called as penalty shots. 
And as a referee, if someone's been around the game, I'm like, do we know what that is anymore? Do we know what goalie interference is anymore? What's offside? It's like, all right, like, can we figure out the rule book here? Because, like, we had the other night a couple of penalty shots. We also have Bedard's goal, highlight real goal come off the board because of an offside challenge. It's like, all right, like, are we really going to be minute about this stuff? But going back to the penalty shots, there are a couple against Nashville. I'm like, eh, these are not penalty shots. And then Nyquist in the third game, after the Preds had two penalty shots against him, the third game, Nyquist has one that absolutely should have been awarded. Just hauled down from behind, never got a scoring opportunity. That is the criteria for a penalty against and a scoring chance denied because of the penalty. Uh, But that was not deemed to be a penalty shot. Nyquist is a very quiet player so far here in Nashville. He didn't show a lot of emotion, but you could tell the call irritated him and several others. But uh, it's slowed down somehow after three games i saw three penalty shots called and it's it's slowed down a little bit since but yeah it's it's interesting i guess the start of a new season there's always some odd nuance there's uh one year it'll be slashing penalties and we'll we'll hear about hundreds of slashes over the first two weeks of the season and then we won't hear about it so much and in another year it'll be hooking and then and I, I guess this year it was just well let's let's jazz things up a little bit during the nhl center ice free preview week let's make sure there's uh as many penalty shots as possible and uh it'll it'll really bring the people in so i don't know what it was all about but it seems to have subsided a little bit now in the in the second week of the season but that first week of the season i felt like every highlights package i watched featured at least one penalty shot and that that to me is crazy yeah it was definitely high and they definitely missed one in the detroit seattle game the other night Jaden schwartz when he fell he threw a stick uh at alex de when he was taking a shot i mean, there's four guys on the ice i just don't know how you missed that um, He's but trying again, to play defense like me. Right, right. But again, look, it's a tough job, hard to be critical of referees, what they do. What we can't be critical of, and this is a perfect way to end everything today, and obviously we talked a lot of Preds, but I want to get your thoughts. Shane Pinto suspended 41 games, sports betting. Obviously, it's a big topic because he didn't bet against the NHL. He didn't do any of that. But we know on the flip side of things, the league's in bed with a lot of these major betting companies. So it's kind of a double-edged sword here. But the league set a standard now that, guys, hey, guys, don't care what you're betting on. Don't care what you're doing with these companies. Can't do it. It is a really strange time that we are in right now when it comes to the partnerships between media companies and the numbers companies. And it is creating getting more and more gray area than I think that uh, anybody really wants to deal with at this time. I know for many, many years covering the sport of the NHL, I could never mention gambling in any way, shape, or form. My radio station that I worked at would not allow us to do that, and it was just considered taboo, really, to talk about betting in any way, shape, or form. So, as the NHL, uh, and, and honestly, I get it, in the last few years, there's been so much money infused into every level of sports and sports media through the different gambling sites and companies. I understand understand the NHL wanting to get in and get their chunk of that, but they really should have communicated uh, this policy. We should have known what this policy was before the first incident happened. We shouldn't have spent, Jim, the entire morning as you did and as I did trying to mine for details and read up and figure out exactly what is going on with this particular situation. So I think the NHL has failed over the last couple of years in creating these new partnerships, but not clearly communicating what those partnerships mean, how they affect the teams, the players, and everyone else trickling down moving forward. So you're right. They've set a standard now, and I bet this is uh, the topic of conversation in almost every room today as players are coming in, checking in for work, getting their meals. They're going to be talking about this because it's it's a very, very sticky situation. But now the NHL has set their standard, and half a season is uh, – that is a very, very heavy penalty compared to some of the other things that they suspend players for. Yeah, absolutely. Obviously, Rasmus Anderson has hit four games. Hey, don't do that. He's missing the outdoor game. Oh, well, too bad. Shouldn't have done it. We know you want to play in it. Too bad. You're not – but it, it's so weird because you watch these games – and you see all this stuff on TV. You see it during every game. All the lines mm-hmm. moves here and there. And you see it advertised everywhere. And I've seen it, you know, 
with some teams during college basketball season, you see everybody, all the teams got a bracket and they do it for fun in house. But now the, the world that we live in, the integrity of the game, everything, it's just so tough because it, it can be viewed as hypocritical, but again, what was he doing and how is it being relayed? And we may not know the details. We, mm-hmm. who knows when it started, could have started with summer, could have started beforehand. We know we needed a new contract. Everything's put on hold. He's going to need, he's going to have to sign, potentially sign his qualifying offer. The suspension's already started. It's just a crazy, crazy situation. And it, look, we got it right here. But again, I can see both sides of everything here because I know there are a lot of people that feel that the NHL is hypocritical considering the major partners that they're in bed with. Jim, just to sum the whole thing up, and I I think that this is a blanket over the NHL right now. The NHL has spent too much time in recent years reacting instead of acting. Mm -hmm. And I can point to the simplest example of the Pride tape, as one of the most recent things, where they backed off and backed off and said, no, we're not going to do it. And then one player does. So one player didn't want to participate, so they changed the whole policy. Then one player did participate, so now they give up on changing the whole policy. The NHL has to to stop being so reactive to everything that is happening in their world and their environment. This could have been easily avoided if the message was clearly communicated. Some of these other dramatic issues that we seem to be dealing with off the ice could all be cleared up if the NHL leadership would just come out and say, this is what we stand for. If hockey is for everyone, then pride tape is allowed and just fine. And if you don't want to use it, that's your option. Fine. And this is just the superficial level example that I'm using right here. There are so many levels of what's going on with the NHL now, but I truly think it comes down to something as simple as that going to the boardroom and saying, we are not going to react to things any longer. We are going to be action oriented. We're going to get out in front of these issues before it becomes a problem because the NHL is an easy punching bag for some other major sports fans and other sports media. So they have to work a little bit harder and more diligently at times. And I wish that their leadership was more cognizant of that and would get, to that be active put out the messages put out the statements and stand by your players when they need you to stand by them i just think the nhl spends too much time behind the scenes reading the headlines or social media or whatever it is listening to us right here and then going oh you know guys maybe we should say something but let's wait another week to see how much worse this gets and and i just don't think that's that's not leadership that's what it comes down to that is not successful leadership and that starts the top with the commissioner himself yeah i agree with you on that 100 percent uh great words right there and and yeah it goes back to the pride tape pride jerseys whatever it doesn't matter you guys want to do it great guys don't want to do it fine whatever it doesn't matter travis Dermott, hats off to you for what you did uh because you know again and this it's not just the nhl pa dropped the ball on this as well should have stood up and said mm-hmm. hey you know what Maybe this isn't a good idea. A couple of guys didn't want to do it. Okay, well, those guys don't need to take warm-ups or they're not going to play that night because, you know, circumstances, that's fine. But you need to show what hockey is for everybody because it is. It doesn't matter. Who cares? Like, right? It's 15 right. minutes of your life. Who? Ca- it, not even. It's like 13 minutes of your right. life and for a warm-up. Who cares? Like, it doesn't matter to me. And I like the, the nights that they do. I really don't care <clears throat> about these specialty jerseys. You want to wear them. You don't want to wear them. Who cares? You want to auction them off, sign them off. Doesn't matter to me. Um, but again, hockey's for everybody. It's crazy. It's crazy times in NHL. But I'm just glad we're talking about games on the ice right. instead of all the off the off the issues, off the ice issues because there's been a lot of them. But I'm just glad we're talking about hockey on the ice. Jim, I got opinions on everything. You know, I'm a kid from Jersey who definitely yes. has something to say about anything that's going on out there in the world. But I try to truly not get too weighted down by the periphery stuff. They are important issues. They are major issues. We need to do things with those issues. But I'm a hockey show. I'm a hockey host and a hockey podcast. I, I go to the games. I break down what happens from when the puck drops until the final buzzer goes. I don't worry too much about what they play on the sound system. I don't worry too much about the Homer PA announcer or any of those other things. What logo is on the helmet this time? What badge they're going to wear on the jersey sleeve? None of that matters to me because i've been watching the sport my entire life i've dedicated my whole life and all of my time effort energies and passion to covering and talking about it and that's the that's where i want 
to be. Of course, I have lots of opinions. I'll be happy to share them with you. Anytime we do the episode that's NHL off ice issues, I'll, I'll gladly jump in on that round table. But for me right now, I have 82 regular season games and hopefully four rounds of a postseason to cover a hundred plus shows to do interviews and articles and all these things. So, you know, I try to focus on what happens on the ice and uh, I use my social media account to sometimes bolster the issues and the agendas. And uh, I think uh, you look around my set. You can see what we're all about here with the renegades of puck. So it's not an issue, but I love talking pucks and Jim, I love hanging out with you and, uh, and, and talking like this. I could do this all day, man. Let's uh, let's do this again sometime. Absolutely. Charlie, this has been an awesome time here on the final word on hockey. I've been your host, Jim Ber- Berenger here. Final word on hockey. Get it. iTunes, Spotify, wherever you get your podcast. I am the voice of full press hockey. That was my long form conversation about all things Nashville Predators hockey with Jersey Jim Berenger from Full Press Hockey. Jim's a great guy, and I sure do appreciate him taking the time to come on this show and then for letting me come on his show as well. Always fun to talk Nashville Predators hockey. Always fun to talk about the National Hockey League itself. We'll be back with full game coverage coming up with the Nashville Predators and the Vancouver Canucks. It's a late start, but we'll be here in the bunker. We'll have it all broken down. We'll have it all ready for you. That was Operation Number 812. Renegades Puck, I sure do appreciate each and every one of you i appreciate your viewership and i certainly appreciate you i'm your host and captain crazy charlie sonier stick taps love and respect